the 12th, 2024, let us gather together and experience the goodness of God. I'm Pastor Trey Comstock. We will begin with our scripture of the week, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 through 11 and verses 16 through 20, and a piece by me entitled, This Isn't About Biblical Kings. Then, Pastor Emily Larson and I will talk scripture, and more specifically, how human failings get in the way of our ability to follow God individually and collectively. But first, a reading from 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 through 11, and verses 16 through 20. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us, then, a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Just as they have done to me from the day that I brought them up out of Egypt to this day forsaking me and serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Now, then, listen to their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, These will be the ways of the king who reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and to run before his chariots. He will take your male and female slaves, and the best of your cattle and donkeys, and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks, and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, No, but we are determined to have a king over us, so that we also may be like other nations, and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. Prospectors don't get rich in gold rushes. The wealth goes to the middlemen. The California gold rush of the mid-1800s certainly played out this way. In the early days of the Bonanza, a few small-time gold panners made it big, but most of the gold made its way into the hands of shovel dealers, tavern owners, dungaree purveyors, and comfort-related suppliers. After all of that, especially later on when the big mining operations got going, a small-time 49er would have made more money staying home. Levi Strauss and Wells Fargo did far better than the vast majority of people upending their lives to pan for specks in an unforgiving terrain. God, via Samuel, makes a similar argument against kings in 1 Samuel chapter 8. The whole chapter centers on a conflict between God and the people. They want a king. God knows that no king will truly do right by the people. By their nature, even good kings require things from the people that they rule. They need soldiers, resources for a royal household, and a material with which to wage war. Kings also have the legal and military power to take their cut off the top. People may prosper under a good king and suffer more under a bad one, but a king will always get theirs, as it says in 1 Samuel verses 16 through 18. He will take your male and female slaves, and the best of your cattle and donkeys, and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks, and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. God paints a bleak but inevitably accurate picture. Yet if we merely consider Saul, David, and Solomon, they did all of these things, and then some. Saul sacrificed the lives of many good soldiers in his revenge quest against David. David deliberately mismanaged his own army in order to enter into a sexual relationship with one of his general's wives. Solomon's harem and various building projects hoovered up a tremendous amount of the nation's resources. And both David and Solomon rank on the good column of biblical kings. 
God's argument here proves even more prophetic as the generations marched onward. 1 Samuel forms part of the Deuteromistic history, which begins with the story of the death of Moses and continues through Joshua, Judges, 1 and 2 Samuel, and 1 and 2 Kings. The Deuteromistic historians carry the story of God's people from entering the Promised Land to the exile. Biblical scholars posit that this group started writing in the reigns of Josiah and Hezekiah, but don't complete their work until the exile. So, as 1 Samuel gets a final editorial pass by a Deuteronomistic historian sitting in Babylon, they would immediately call to mind the litany of truly terrible rulers that ran the lives of God's people. In fact, optimistically, the score stands at around like 8 good kings and something like 30 bad ones split across the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. On the good column, we have Asa, Jehoshaphat, Josiah, Amaziah, Azariah, Jotham, Hezekiah, Josiah. On the bad side, we have Rehoboam, Abijah, Jehoram, Ahaziah, Ataliah, Ahaziah, Manasseh, Amon, Jehoaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, Zedekiah, Jeroboam the first, Nadab, Baasha, Elah, Zemiri, Omiri, Ahab, Azahiah, Jehoram, Jehu, Jehoaz, Jehoash, Jeroboam the second, Zechariah, Shelem, Menhem, Pekahiah, Pekahiah, and Hoshea. By 722 BC, the Assyrians take out Israel. By 586 BC, the Babylonians carry the majority of Judah into exile, knocking over the temple in the process. The Deuteronomistic historians lay a lot of the blame for these two tragedies at the feet of awful and selfish leadership who could not rule in a godly way. I suspect that we all now feel the urge to pat ourselves on the back and celebrate that this whole way of existence passed away millennia ago. It's not actually true. Maybe the biblical kings possessed particularly poor character, but even the good kings did a lot of what God warned about. Humans, even ones with excellent character, struggle to entirely eliminate their own self-interest, to introduce a human into the pathway between God's will and your life opens up the possibility for human selfishness to creep into what should be a perfect system. Churches like ancient nations, need leaders. And the nature of that leadership means that they take on the role of communicating God's will to God's people. Pastors, priests, bishops, district superintendents, popes, etc., each count as a fallible person inserted into your relationship with God's will for you and for the people around you. I suspect that we have a better hit rate than the descendants of David, but the history of Christianity, even modern Christianity, serves as a stark reminder of the ways our own self-interest shows up. It's God's will that I become the earthly ruler of the world. It's God's will that we conquer that country, drive out its inhabitants, and steal all their treasures. It's God's will that the church buy me in an absurd amount of designer clothes. It's God's will that I have the fanciest private jet imaginable. It's God's will that you enter into a more personal relationship with me. It's God's will that we all work to cover up my crimes against church members because if it came out, that would hurt the church. Pastors speak those lines, or some version of them, all the time. We bear witness to the wreckage, people damaged, churches destroyed, our reputation as a faith put through the paper shredder. The major streaming services created a whole industry around church gone wrong, tell-all documentaries that often boil down to a pastor declaring their wrongdoing, the will of the divine, and getting away with it for an illogical amount of time. We do believe that we've got the biblical kings beat, but pastors don't always live up to the trust placed in their hands either. We get ours and leave congregations high and dry. Clergy need to do their own spiritual work to perpetually seek God and push away our own selfishness. 
However, congregations have a role here as well. Pay attention. Do your own discerning. Ask questions. Show up. Recognize your role in holding clergy accountable and maintaining the health of the church. This isn't an argument against leaders. But when leadership interacts with communicating God's will, everyone needs to work together so we don't end up like Ahab, Jeroboam, Jeroboam II, or any number of people named Ahaziah. So as you just heard in the piece, and, and this is another one where the sermon went at least a similar uh, direction, I, God has a vision of how we are to be led, and we have a vision of how we are to be led. And those visions do not always, or often, but certainly not always, coincide. And we, what we watch in, this ended up, weirdly, this ended up being a piece about the entire deuteronomistic history, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Which is an incredibly hard word to say into a camera. A uh, lot. Uh, well, and so are all of the names that you read. A yeah, oh lot God. of names in that. You should see the outtakes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> of you know, and and you can hear like uh, usually uh, because I'm not dealing with biblical names, you don't hear how dyslexic I am live on camera. Here, if you listen carefully enough, it's like let's watch the dyslexic kid try to name. Ah, uh, I, I swear to God, there are three people named Ahaziah. I swear to God, uh -huh. there are three people named Ahaziah, <laughs> and none of them were good. Like it's just, but like we have. The entire the story of the deuteronomistic history is, and this is like a really key <coughs> moment in it. There, you know, one of the key moments is obviously like the death of Moses and the crossing into the promised land. Like that's a big deal. But what this one is is okay. Uh, Y'all wanted a king. It's going to go bad, even when it's good. Odds are there are some things about it that are not going to be great. Right. I got a good, you know, Bathsheba reference in there. Um, you know, Solomon, Solomon's a lot. Uh, and then even like even if you look at the guys who, you know, helped commission the Deuteronomistic history, we think are Hezekiah and Josiah, like even with them, it's not perfect. So mm -hmm. we have this. Again, like, they literally like, I want to be led like the other kids. God, can I be led like the other kids? And God's like, I mean, sure, right? It's this great, like, you get this, uh, this terrifying window into the will of God, right? You get this, mm -hmm. okay? You, you get how kind of tactical and knowing that God is. Because God mm -hmm. goes, listen to the people. This is... A horrifically bad idea. Tell them all of the ways that it's going to be a bad idea. God being God also knows they're going to do it anyways. But have on record so that we can all look back and go, these, you said you wanted this. And it's this great parenting of, and in that day, you will cry out. You will cry out to the Lord <laughs> because of this king. And maybe I'm not going to help you because you made this choice, right? It is mm -hmm. like we like the the soft the softer parenting side of God, which exists. But there is also that hard-nosed side parenting side of God that we like to carefully ignore. Because when you right. really look at how like the will the will of God functions and how God functions as your divine parent, Sometimes, it, like, it should scare you the level to which God knows you and mm -hmm. that God is not always going to stop us from the consequences of our own behavior. If this was a show where we swear, there's a great modern saying that I use often um, about finding out uh, that, <laughs> that it applies here. God is literally looking at the people and go, F around and find out. Right, you want to f around, yeah. you may well find out, and then the rest <laughs> of the deuteristic history from this point forward is the people finding out. Yes, this is very much 
It reminds me of uh, like when my daughter wants to wear her dress up shoes instead of her yep. real shoes when we're going somewhere and she's throwing yep. a fit about it. Right. And I'm like, look, you can wear them, but it's going to hurt your feet. And what inevitably happens is obviously we start walking and our feet hurt. Um, and so, you know, letting your kids sit in the consequences of their choices of, you know, or not wearing a jacket when it's cold outside or whatever, you know, pick whatever wardrobe battle that your kid has that day with you. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yes, which are, it's which are very are much are? sitting, right, sitting in the consequences of, you know, I told you to wear a jacket, you didn't want to wear your coat, now you're cold, right? I told you to wear comfortable shoes, you didn't wear comfortable shoes, now your feet hurt. Um, God says, I told you you didn't want a king, you elected a king, and now look at the consequences, look at the mess that you're in now. Um, and I told you that I wouldn't save you in that day, that you would be crying, and here you are crying. <laughs> Well, and it, I, this didn't come up in, in either of the pieces, but I think is is germane here of like we often, often in the midst of tragedy, we get to that question of how can a loving God let this happen, right? And and I'm right. sure, uh, and, and you know, you 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 read Lamentations, you le- you read some of the like sadder pieces of the Old Testament, you you read. Like there's a there's a great psalm that I about that it really feels like the psalmist is sitting in the back of a wagon as they're heading into exile, looking back at a devastated Jerusalem. Right, it's about as close to like mm-hmm. a, a a boots on the ground journalistic take on the exile that we have. And, and I taught on this recently, and Lord knows I can't remember the psalm. There's this psalm that is like <laughs> the devastation of Jerusalem. Oh my God! It's and it's an lament, right? Like, oh my God, it's so terrible. Um, and mm-hmm. you ask yourself, like, how can a loving God let this happen? And it is because a loving God, like, saving you from sometimes saving. This is not the only reason why bad things happen. But one of the reasons why bad things happen is that a loving God understands the consequences are sometimes a part of love, right? Like we want, yeah. and, 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 and I don't think most people don't parent that way. And if you do parent that way, God love you. I, it, I, mm. But like, you know, I think anyone who involved in the raising of anybody, whether it be, you know, children or mentoring other adults or whatever is like just sometimes the consequences are a part of this and essentially what Mm -hmm. this move that they make here here in you know first samuel 8 leads to the exit leaves over the course of whatever it is 40 kings right um so many generations 40 kings uh, several named Mm -hmm. ahaziah um, all of, you know, uh, that's a Christian band we need, the Ahaziahs, you know, um, this is, I, I, you know, I, I used to, I, I, I used to, to, they're terrible. Well, I used to, I used to, uh, uh, we used to play with, uh, uh, a band whose tagline was don't feed the bears. Cause there's that bit where they yes. pick, I can't remember if it's Elijah or Elisha, but like they pick on him. Um, the children are picking on him. And I think for being for bald. being old. Oh, for being old. Okay, there we uh-huh. go. Um, you've for being old and bald. Yeah. Pastor Trick, being old and bald, and then mm-hmm. he calls down the she bears on them. Right. This is just like this random <laughs> story in somewhere in Kings that like a bunch of uh-huh. kids get mauled by she bears, and so their T-shirt said "Don't feed the bears," which That's I love. Awesome. This is like you lie. know the Ahaziahs. Anyways, um, like this over the course of a couple hundred years is going to inevitably, inexorably lead to the exile. And mm-hmm. we get to that place where we super lament the exile. And, and I, when it's happening, I, you know, that psalm is devastating. But also, yeah. you had this warning here, then you have all of the other prophetic warnings about, hey, change your ways. Hey, change your ways. Hey, change your ways. And they didn't, and they didn't, and they didn't, and they didn't. And so eventually, yep. they found out. But this, to me, is like, yeah. the, not or the original sin has really loaded theological terms, but you know what I mean? Like, the, the inciting event. Like, this is the first choice that sets up the exile. That yeah. we could have come out of the judges and just kept going with that, but actually listened to God. 
They think the problem right. is we don't have a king. The actual problem is we don't listen to God. Right. And like a king doesn't make that better because now, you know, what I talked about in the piece, you now have this, you now have this fallible intermediary between you and God. Right? Right. And anytime you do that, that's dangerous. Right. It's some maybe it is, you know, and we got, you know, this became literally entitled the piece. This is not about biblical kings, to make my point. This is not about biblical kings. This is about <laughs> godly leader. This is about godly leadership um, and mm-hmm. the dangers therein. But like anytime you're putting that other Yabo in, the, in between you and God's will, there's danger. And maybe you've maybe you found a good one and they, they exist. They're good pastors. They were good biblical kings. But the hit rate on biblical mm-hmm. kings isn't is terrible. It's not isn't great. It's like they're right. batting less than what well, they're batting less than like they're batting like two hundred, right? Like it's a bad hit yeah. rate. Like you would you would get benched yeah. in the MLB for hitting that badly. And <laughs> pastors, it's probably better, but it is by no means perfect. Right. It is, and I'm glad that you brought that up. That because we do tend to put pastors, popes, preachers, yeah. whoever in authority uh, on a pedestal um, because we tend to insert people between ourselves and God because it's more comfortable that way because then there's somebody up the line to blame. You know, it's 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 the military chain of command. There's somebody up the line to blame it on um, besides ourselves, right. besides sitting in our own responsibility of it. Um, but the truth is we have a direct line. Um yeah. We are the one in relationship with God. And so our relationship with God is our responsibility in the end. Um, and you, you talked about, you know, how come God lets bad things happen to people? You know, why is there, you know, I, I'm not, why is my life as messed up as it is? Well, did you choose to live a life um, engaged right. in drugs, alcohol, whatever that led you to this point? Um, some of this is the consequence of your actions. Um And not that God can't save you from this because everything is redeemable. Nothing is irredeemable by God. Um, But it is our choice whether or not we choose to grab onto that redemption, to grab onto that grace, to follow God's will for our lives. And if we don't, then we sometimes also get to sit in the consequences of our actions, Mm -hmm. um, that our life is not without consequence just because we do have this relationship with God, just because there is that line of grace, there is that possibility of redemption, we still have to take hold of it and be responsible for our choices in following God's will, 100%. Well, and also, this is where we all have a responsibility for one another, right? To one another, because maybe it's your own sin, what failed choices, that is hurting you. But... Or maybe it is somebody else's and you're the collateral damage. And this is a lot yes. of, like, you know, I I tried to, in the piece, push both pastors and congregations, right? If, you're, yes. if what your pastor is saying sounds wrong, maybe it is. <laughs> Shocking. Right. Maybe it is. <laughs> uh, I... You know, I, we've talked about this before. I, I I watch a lot of like church gone wrong documentaries. This feels like an important right. professional thing, <coughs> and so often that those come back to and and also the the movie Spotlight about uh, the Boston yeah. Globe uh, uh, starring Mark Ruffalo. It's it's a good movie. It's, it's a powerful movie. It's a painful movie, uh, but mm-hmm. so often it comes back to. Well, and the, the spotlight's a Catholic context, so I can use just the word dude. Like, this was God's dude. And God's dude yeah. said, we're doing this. And so, man, this is God's dude. And that's really hard to hear. Because mm-hmm. when we build these systems, and it's not, it's not uniquely a Catholic problem, you know? The Southern Baptist Church, uh, Southern Baptist Convention, um, is meeting right now. And they are having their own wrestling with, um, and it was the Houston Chronicle that uh, kind of Mm -hmm. was one of the first to break this story of the the massive tales of abuse in the Baptist church. And Mm -hmm. the narratives sound remarkably similar. 
this was God's due. And, and so when, when you are in these positions of being God's dude, do debt or do dem, um, like then there is that like huge piece on us to recognize the inherent power in that and perhaps not propose that covering up your crimes uh, is God's will. But so often when there are pastor crimes, the, it is either like, oh, it's God's will or you, God wouldn't want us to damage the church. If my crimes like that so often, that is a real thing that's said. Mm. And we got some like yeah. nasty of like, oh, y'all are being so you have got a we got a we got our first nasty gram on Facebook. We got a nasty gram on YouTube a few weeks ago about <laughs> we, female clergy. We and, and this time we get about my <laughs> about my uh uh my incisive rhetoric. Um and no, I, I think the, I I would think of it that way if it wasn't if it wasn't really happening all over the place <coughs> that mm -hmm. When a leader, when a leader who is meant to be, a, especially a leader who is by like inherently position a godly leader, whether that be a godly biblical king or a modern clergy person, right? There's like real danger in that, and so everyone involved needs to be involved in the accountability piece of self accountability of like, is it really God's will that we cover up my crimes? That, that doesn't sound plausible. Does it? I mean, it sounds convenient. Doesn't sound plausible. <laughs> and then to build cultures within churches and, 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 and this clergy have a role, but laity have a role of understanding the inherent fail ability, fallibility of God's yes. dude, do debt or do dem. And, to to think to build accountable structures to protect like there it it is really easy to just outsource god's will to somebody else that is yes. not how god meant it to be clearly and that is often where certainly in our modern conversations the danger shows up 100 percent, and there's I love that you brought up the the failability of yeah. pastors, the failability of. So if you have someone in a position of authority over you um, who hung the moon and can do no wrong, um, maybe they exist. But unless they're Jesus, recognize that a person is still a person and that a person will make yeah. mistakes. Um, and that, you know, there is a failability, that there is a fallibility to every human on earth. And so, except for Jesus. So unless that person is Jesus, um, recognize that. Admire them, but evaluate them, right? Evaluate the people who right. you choose to be mentored by. Um, evaluate the people whom you choose to elect into power over you, whether that be in the church or otherwise. Um, but recognize that your mentor is also someone that needs to be um, held accountable, um, just as we all do. I and I think some of this, and this guy kind of strays into the other show that we do, but I think you and I both have lived too many versions of we, we're at a church where it has gone wrong for whatever reason. Right. And the, the like, you're doing the investigative of how did this happen? How did we get here? And a lot of times the answer is, well, the pastor said this was a good idea. And yeah. I sit back and go, well, that pastor probably shouldn't have said that. But also, why did you listen? And it goes back to, well, right. because of the pastor, right? Mm -hmm. And there, you know, in our denomination, the United Methodist Church, there are accountability mechanisms that exist that are seldom used for the right reasons. So we have, I don't want to get into this because this is not a polity podcast, but like we have these structures that are meant to be a check on pastoral power. <laughs> There's an annual pastoral evaluation. I have a supervisor called the district superintendent. Uh, and like a congregation can talk to that person. Um, there is a congregational committee that is supposed to be responsible to the main, you know, both caring for the pastor and holding the pastor accountable. 
And often how those mm-hmm. structures get used is we've got this person we don't like. We've got this person who doesn't fit. We got this person that is pushing us to change and we don't want to change. And so we're going to bring the ax on that. Per- or we're going to bring the ax on that pastor. That's how those structures often get used. Yeah. It often gets used as a way to weaponize the structure against the pastor. And mm-hmm. that is in itself kind of a form of accountability, but it, it can get you. I, I often see it used poorly and yeah. seldom see it used as intended of as this check on is the pastor really speaking the word of God or not? Is the pastor really expressing the will of God for us in this place or not? And so mm-hmm. even where like there are plenty of churches that are wild, wilder and woolier than ours, but even in really structured places like the United Methodist church, like the Catholic church, right? Like how did the leadership and accountability right. structure of the Catholic church get utilized? It was to move the problem people around and the United Methodist Church has been guilty yeah. of some of that too, of like, oh, we have these accountability structures. Mm-hmm. Cool, you're gonna go over there now. No, that's not good. So, but no. from like the lay empowerment side, it is, hey, you have as much access to the will of God as everybody else, and yes, like godly communities, whether they be the a godly nation of of Israel or Judah or Israel the second. Um, or it is a modern church, which is, um, thanks to Mm -hmm. the logic of Romans, like an extension of Israel, right? Uh, when it is, um, it is everybody discerning together, everybody holding one another accountable so that you don't end up with an Ahaziah situation. There's the band name, the Ahaziah situation. There we go. I found it. I found the band. I found the band name. That's it. It's the Ahaziah situation. Uh, uh-huh. So you don't end up with an Ahaziah situation of, you know, I, what are we going to do? And like, what we were supposed to do was you, we, we warned you not to have a king. Like, that's what you were supposed to do. And a church is like, well, we, mm-hmm. you know, the, the pastor said this is what we're supposed to do. And I'm like, did you think this is what <laughs> we were supposed to do? Did, well, I didn't want to say anything. Well, I... I'm not saying the pastor should have done whatever it is the pastor did. I spent a lot of my life saying those things. This pastor should not have done that. Oh my God, this pastor should not have done that. But also, if you if you kind of thought it was wrong at the time, rock the boat. Because you might yes. save <laughs> a church, save a person. Yes. Like, the church universal can never die. And so if you're like, oh, but if I do this, it will hurt the church. No, no, no. If it is excising a problem, you might be helped. Your local church may suffer, right? The, that is a part of it. But the church universal yep. will be healthier and fewer people yes. will be hurt. I, yes. We were not, God never intended us to be ruled indirectly. Right. God just wanted like, here's this like voice box, like in a whole point of a prophet. Right. Because the prophet is not a good voice box. The prophet stops being a voice box. Like the whole point is like you just have this like voice box. And now with the presence of the Holy Spirit, we don't even need that. Right. We all can be that we all can have. that. If if what is happening doesn't feel right. Maybe it's because you don't want to change, and that's an interesting conversation to have. Or maybe because it's objectively wrong. <laughs> and you got to discern. Right. We all have to discern that. Because pastors need to be able to, you know, Lord knows, pastors need to be able to push congregations to change. But that's yes. different than doing something that is good for the pastor and not good for the church. Yes. And so using your voice, using your discernment, um, those tool sets that are available to you, just as well as they are available to any pastor, preacher, you know, yeah. prophet above you. Very, very important. Um, and as clergy, as people in roles of leadership, because everyone should be in both, right? You should be mentored by someone, but you should also be mentoring yeah. someone. You should be discipling someone else. Um, make sure that you are not so worried about being comfortable um, that you are just going 
yeah. say the things that tickle the ears also that you that you don't want to hurt the church um and so you don't want to rock the boat because sometimes listening to the will of god is rocking the boat um and carrying out the right. will of god is rocking the boat is you know the, you said something when we got that nasty gram to me it was if they're not shooting at you you're probably not doing something right right um <laughs> if you're not right. getting nasty grams from somebody you to might me. not be yeah. doing something right <laughs> um right. so making sure that you are speaking truth even when that truth is hard to hear but you're speaking truth in love um but still speaking the truth and trying to follow the will of god to the best of your ability for your context and your congregation and that and that it is this that it is this discernment piece of we are not and then the sermon went a little more in a one of my genres of sermon is like yo the Bible never meant you to keep up with the Joneses. Yo, the Bible never meant you to keep up with the Joneses. Like it is just like the Bible only meant, you know, God really only meant for you to like love God, love people and not be yeah. like all the other kids on the block. Like, There's just right. Just because they motivation. have a king doesn't mean you need a right. king. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the ultimate. Hey, if they if they jump off a cliff, will you? And the and the answer right. God's people is yes. No, but we want a king. <laughs> And you can just, you know, uh, one of my, you know, one of my favorite memes out there is Jean-Luc Picard uh, resting his head in his hands, right? That, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and oh, yeah. uh, this is, you can just see Samuel and God both as Jean-Luc Picard resting his head in his hands going, you know, or, or a good Kermit, <laughs> sheesh, uh, like, uh. yes, um, because... Mm -hmm. You know, we get we get really caught up in wanting to keep up with the Joneses. And that isn't that is not the way of God either. Right. right. And so we open and, and it is one of those ways to kind of connect the two pieces of it's one of those ways we really get ourselves into trouble that we think not, oh, I want to do the will of God, but. Hey, those other people over there have that. And then a leader shows up and says, I can give you that. You want that? Heck mm -hmm. yeah. Let's go. I can give you that. And you go, well, this is great. This feels good. Yes. Because you're getting the earthly thing that you want. And then you are mistaking the earthly thing that you want for the will of God. <coughs> because maybe even it goes well for a while of like, oh my God, we've got all this stuff. Cool. Um, thinking of things like Hillsong, New York and, or, uh, uh, and Carl Lentz. Right? Oh my God, it's this is great. Yeah. I, we, so many people, yep. uh huh, uh huh. Was that the will of God though? Because getting the thing that looks like earthly mm -hmm. success feels good, but not everything that feels good is of God, right? Including right. that, including church success, mm -hmm. success in near quotes mm -hmm. of like, oh my God, there's hella people here, uh huh, uh huh. But is that a sign that you are doing the will of God? Or is that a sign that we've once again handed the keys of the kingdom over to a narcissist? They're doing narcissist things, which are really easily to mistake for the will of God. Because, again, narcissism, much like the devil in Revelation, is like the Diet Coke of Jesus. And so you're getting the Diet Coke of Jesus. It feels close enough. Although it's full of aspartame, it's probably giving you cancer. And, and you feel good... And then you wonder why it all goes bad because the message of revelation and the beast is not that they're like so different from God. It's that they're like, again, I often use the diet Coke of God. That's the point is that like right. evil and the will of God are not, are actually diametrically opposed, but they don't feel diametrically opposed. One is just, just right. enough degrees off that over the long term, the arc goes in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. that's why mm -hmm. that's why we don't want biblical kings although they got them and it went bad right. and that's why accountability and discernment and wanting the right things for your life for your church really stinking matters and that's yes. as good a place as any to end this show because <laughs> i can get real angry about this uh if you have i, I actually you know what i would love to like share stories um, for reasons of confidentiality and the jobs we hold. Uh, Emily and I are limited on the stories we can tell. 
um, about what we have seen. Right. Because uh, there are legal ramifications and professional ramifications that just are real. Um, I, I would love to hear your stories of church gone wrong um, and to talk about that mm-hmm. as ways of accountability and discernment. Uh, the goodness of God pod at gmail.com. That is the goodness of God pod at gmail.com. If you want more of what we do around here, hey, good news, we do a lot of it. Uh, Facebook.com slash servants now, YouTube.com slash servants now, servantsnow.org on the internet. Um, and it's at, uh, what are we, are we at servants now and everything? So we've got some stuff at going servants up on now. Instagram now. Yep. Um, uh, are we on the, t- we're on the back on the TikToks? Is that going? We're, we're on the TikToks. Yep. Yep. Yes. TikTok, Instagram, we're at Facebook, Servants Now and everything. If you, yes. <laughs> we figure we are manufacturing <laughs> short form content. Uh, I'm learning about editing in vertical video and I want to die. Like, I hate it. Because, y'all, it's uh, the, the why. This, mm, uh, anyways, um, you can hold your phone. This is going to work on video. You can hold your phone like this, not just like this. It's remarkable, people. Anyways, uh, this show and everything else we do here in the Media Lab is made possible by a generous innovators grant by the Texas Annual Conference, the United Methodist Church. If you want to support us, like, comment, subscribe, watch in uh, watch in horizontal video, uh, leave us five star reviews on Apple Podcast, share this content with other people, and they should watch it in horizontal view. And go in peace to love and serve the Lord. We'll see you next time.